a lot of people go, well, how do you study glaciers in, in Arizona? You know, why would you, why would you do that? I mean, there, there, there can't be any good glaciologists in Arizona. And au contraire, some of the best glaciologists are in Arizona because they spend their, they, they spend the summers getting out of Arizona and up onto ice fields and the like. And then when you spent three months on an ice field, the last thing you want to go is go into a cold climate, cold environment. What you want to do is you want to be in a nice, mild and, and, and temperate environment and, and Tempe, Arizona certainly met the, those criteria. So I sp got to spend a, a couple of uh, nice summers up on the Juneau ice field in, in Alaska, probably four, four summers in the Juneau ice field. Um, I've done uh, uh, work on Andrews Glacier up here in Rocky, Na Ma Rocky Mountain National Park and a couple of little small glaciers in the Sierra Nevada of California that uh, other glaciologists poo-poo and say those aren't real glaciers, but if you look at what the uh, International Glaciological Society uh, defines a glacier, any mass of ice that shows evidence of past or present motion, and they certainly, they certainly have that that uh, going for them. Of course, you could also say that an ice cube sliding down a, a cutting board would also qualify as a glacier with that definition. And you'd be right. So there are some limitations to all of that. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, <coughs> is uh, the glaciers of Patagonia down in Chile, and how I got how I got interested in in all of this. Um, if you take a look at where these these uh, these glaciers are, and down here, way down here, is Antarctica, and of course that's the largest ice mass on the planet, and the second largest ice mass is way up here in the northern hemisphere, Greenland. But probably most of you don't know that the third and fourth largest ice masses on the planet are right here. The Southern Patagonia Ice Field, and the one we're going to be talking about today, the Northern Patagonia Ice Field right here. And <clears throat> the Southern Patagonia Ice Field has been extensively studied, and there's been lots of research completed there. The Northern Patagonia Ice Field, even though it's the fourth largest, has very, very limited studies going on there. And part of that is it's so hard to get to. And so from here, from here there is a, uh, uh, there's a little bit closer view of this whole thing. Uh, from here, it's a 12-hour flight to Santiago, Chile, and then you hop on another plane and fly another three hours south down to a place called Balmaceda, Balmaceda Airport. Uh, the Chileans put it right on the border with Argentina just to cheese off the, uh, the Argentinians. <coughs> and you can actually see the, the border crossing right next to the airport, and all of the flights that are landing at Balmaceda are flying through Argentinian airspace. And so it's just, they put it there just to, just to you know, needle, needle the Argentinians because there's such a great uh, rivalry between the two. But here's the northern Patagonia ice field. And then from Balmaceda, it's a six-hour dirt road dirt road uh, uh, trip to a small town called Puerto Bertrand. And Puerto Bertrand is on the Green Baker River, Green Baker River if you're a fly fisherman from the United States or the Rio Baker if, you're, if you live in Chile. So the Rio Baker is there and it's a wonderful fly fishing uh, place and hard to get to. But from Puerto Bertrand then to get up to the ice field, you have to take a 45 minute Zodiac boat ride across Lago Plomo and then you start hiking on, uh, you start hiking on uh, 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 Don, Don Ramon Sierra's Estancia land uh, at the other end of Lago Plomo. And you'll see a picture of Don Ramon here in a little bit. Uh, and it's a two-day hike from there to get up to the ice field. And once you get on the ice field, then you've got, you are away from everything. And this is, this is the, this portion of South America was the, uh, last place that humans inhabited on the planet, the last place, because the indigenous people, the Mapuche, who lived here, they were coastal dwellers. They had no reason to go into the mountains because there isn't any big game in the mountains there, not a lot of food, and it was a very harsh climate up in here with the ice field and everything like that. And so there are places right in this area here. This is Lago Plomo, by the way, right here. And so we're going to be going across like this and then down and then out of this area. And I'll show you some, some slides as we move along through here. Um, but the question then begs is, what does this northern Patagonia ice field have to do with Rocky Mountain National Park? Well, some of you may have seen this before, the Vostok Ice Core record that was pulled up from uh, Vostok, Antarctica in 1985. It was a joint Soviet, then Soviet Union, French uh, science expedition that pulled up 
this ice core that allowed us to look back in time 400,000 years. Since then, that's been extended to 800,000 years. And it was the first real good link that we had between uh, global temperatures and greenhouse gases. So we see carbon dioxide is the green line there, temperature is the blue line there, and so there's a nice little correlation that's going on between the two. So we'll come back to this, but this is uh, part of the answer that we're going to get to and we'll circle back to at the end of the, end of the presentation. So how did I get interested in this, this place so far away from, from my home? I, I teach a course called Glacial Geomorphology at the, the university. And back in 2000 and 2014, I had a uh, large man who always sat up front. He was an older student, not incredibly old, but he was probably in his late 20s instead of your <laughs> typical 18, or 18 to 22-year-old 20, student that you might have at the university. And uh, he was very interested, in, and it was clear that he, he you know, he, he, he was of Latin descent, and, and uh, he was very interested, spoke with a very thick uh, Chilean accent, and uh, he came up and, and was probably the best, best student I ever had in, in that class. He was just great and always full of questions, full of questions, and, and he let me know that he had been a guide for uh, this gringo down in Chile who had developed the, the, the ice and glacier trail. And I'm going, have you go, he goes, have you heard of it? Have you heard of the ice and glacier trail? I said, no, I haven't. He goes, oh, he goes, I guided with, with, with Jonathan for five years before coming here. You know, and, and he goes, I, we had some scientists that were up there, and he goes, I'm taking the class because I want to understand what the scientists were looking at. And I'm going, okay, great. And so we're going through all of this, and, and he's getting more and more enthusiastic. He goes, you have to go there. You have to go there. We have to take students down there. And this is, you know, we're, as we're going through the semester, and, and I'm going, well, Manuel, you know, that, that's great. And uh, I'd, I'd love to, you know, and we get towards the end of the semester. He goes, so we got to get, we got to get together. We got to, we got to take students down there. He goes, he goes, with your knowledge and, 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 and my connections, he goes, we could take, we have a winterum, a winterum that, that, that would go right after the last, last, uh, uh, the day right after Christmas and take you to the beginning of the, of the next spring semester. And he goes, the beauty of it is it's summer down there, so you can get away from here. And I'm, I'm going, okay, this is sounding, starting to sound rather, rather interesting and, and nice. And uh, I said, we're in finals week now at this point. I said, Manuel, put together an itinerary, put together an itinerary and, you know, shoot it to me. And he goes, I said, in, in January, if we've got something here, I'll, we'll go to international studies and, and see what they think. You know, we're going to buy them and see what they think. And I thought that would be the last I would hear of it because most times when you finish a semester, it's the last you see of students, all right? Not Manuel. A week later, I had an itinerary. It was a, it was a two week, two week uh, field itinerary for, for students to, to go down there. And he called my bluff. And so <laughs> I set up the meeting with, uh, with international studies and uh, we went that following March, which was beginning of, of autumn down there, we went down on a, on a one week bomb through the ice and glacier trail with the idea then of bringing students down the following December. And so this was my first look uh, at the Chilean countryside. It was just starting to turn autumn and March down there, and so the leaves were starting to turn. Uh, this is Don Ramon Sierra, and, and Don Ramon is a gaucho in the truest sense of the word. Uh, he owns the land behind Lago Plomo, uh, and we traversed it for two days. Uh, just a special, special, special man. And uh, he and his wife uh, uh, have entertained and, and housed me a couple of times and put on some incredible meals for us as we come in and out of the ice cap. Uh, just some other pictures. This is Lago Plomo going up across it. Uh, the, the Don Ramon's uh, land is, is back in here, and the ice cap, the northern Patagonia ice field, is back here. Uh, some other pictures just getting into the area. This is Lago General Carrera, so the second largest, second largest lake in all of South America. Uh, huge, uh, huge area here. And this is the, uh, the Green, green, uh, green River, uh, or Rio Bacher. Uh, and, and we had some students out on boats and things before we headed up to the ice cap. Uh, looking down, this is the actual color of the, of the, uh, of the river. So all the colors you see are very, uh, very accurate. The other thing I want to tell you about, about Manuel Castro, he's the, uh, the guide, uh, 
um, the, the, the gringo, the gringo that, that set up this ice and glacier trail was a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Leidick, who grew up in Evergreen. And Jonathan, Jonathan, who I know very, very well at this stage of my life now, because we've been down there four times and had students down three times at, at, so far and working to bring more. Jonathan grew up in Evergreen. His mother was a school teacher up there. And one day she came home, and the reason he ended up down in Chile was she came home with somebody had thrown a map had thrown a map of South America out in the garbage can outside of Evergreen Evergreen Junior High School, which is what it was when he was when he was going there. She brought home, thought he might like it. Turned out he loved it, loved maps, and he put it put the map on the ceiling above his bed so he could look at it. And he really fixated on the southern end of South America because there weren't any names. There weren't any names on the on the peaks. There had no names there. And he goes, he goes, I want to go to that place. He goes, I want to, this is, this is some place I want to explore. And he gave his, uh, he, he, he tried his hand at, at college. He did a semester at Boulder uh, before he realized college wasn't for him and bought a one-way ticket down to, uh, down to South America and ended up doing guide work for the fly fishermen on the Rio Bakker. Kept his money, saved his money, saved his money, and Grew, and grew into the trust of the Chilean people down there from Puerto Patron. He was living in Puerto Patron and eventually, eventually uh, was accepted as a Chilean. And if you speak to him, according to Manuel, if you speak to him on the phone, you wouldn't know that you weren't talking to a Chilean. Same accent, same mannerisms, everything like that. So in all respects, Jonathan is now, uh, is now Chilean for that, for that. But he started out, he wanted to hike hike all around these areas that hadn't been named. He wanted to climb all of these peaks that hadn't been named. And in the process, he realized that he could go up onto the northern Patagonia ice field and hike, go up one canyon, and then come down the next 100 miles further to the north. And he set out and he created this, this ice and glacier trail. And then uh, he ended up, one of, the, uh, one of the gauchos was selling his land, dying and moving, not dying, but he was just moving closer into Puerto Betran. And so the land that was adjacent to Don Ramon's, but further back and closer to the ice field, which was Rancho Palomar, he bought it. So he bought it for 20,000 20, acres or something like that that he bought for $20,000 something yeah so it's ridiculous but it takes two days to get there so what's the value of land if you can't get to there he saw he saw the value of the land and so he he uh, established uh, Rancho Palomar there and he was always then coming out a hundred miles away at Sol de Mayo uh, another estancia down there that was uh, owned by another gaucho who he you know talked up and, and knew of you know knew and and I forget that the name of the other gaucho escapes me, but he was a very old man. And at 85, his daughter convinced him to move to Puerto Betrand with him, and he ended up selling the Sol de Mayo to Sol de Mayo to, uh, uh, to to Jonathan as well. So at that point, Jonathan has the entry point and the exit point on this ice and glacier trail. He makes a deal with the Chilean government for for rights to because the the, the ice field is in. Uh, La, um, Parque Nacional Laguna San Rafael, uh, San Rafael. So he makes a deal. He had the sole concession of that portion of the of the ice field, and he starts running outdoor adventure treks through this area. And he would never take more than ten people at a time, and there would only be your party on the trail. And so he he didn't want to see what had happened to the southern Patagonian ice field befall what had happened befall the northern Patagonia ice field. And so uh, if you've ever heard the horror stories there, the Torres de Pana uh, area, it's overrun, there's trash everywhere, and, and he was horrified by that whole thing. And so he always kept it very, very limited. To this day, he still kept it very, fairly limited. So this is the, uh, this is, this is the area, and this is uh, uh, the confluence of the, the Neff. We'll see a movie of this a little bit later on. But this is the amount of water that comes through here. The area is, is so rich hydrologically uh, that the Chilean government had, had great plans. The Chinese had approached the Chilean government with the idea of building dams and creating cheap hydroelectric power to send to Santiago. And there was a very, very large uh, battle that took place between the people who saw this for its, who saw it for its, um, its uh, ecotourism poten potential 
versus those who wanted the hydroelectric power. And so the battle went on throughout most of the early 2000s. And uh, in, in about 2012, they had a vote and they voted not to have the dams. But it's a continuing fight, it's a continuing battle, and it will continue to go on. This is some of the scenery as you go on up through there. The Andes Mountains are a nice tall mountain range. And it's a very interesting area climatically because you're in a very narrow portion of South America. South America is maybe only 300 miles wide uh, at, its, at its width uh, as, you get, as you get there. Uh, at that point, that, that far south, you're not too far south in terms of latitude. It's only about 45 degrees south latitude, 45, 47 degrees south latitude. So it's really not in a high latitude region. So why, why would you have a huge, the, the, the fourth largest ice field in this location? Because you have these giant mountains, the Andes that come up and the air that comes across the Pacific and onto the west coast, as it comes onto the west coast of, of, of uh, Chile down there, it's immediately lifted upwards. So you have, and then as it goes off the back end, the lee side of the Andes Mountains, and then goes out into the Atlantic side of things, that air doesn't touch land again before it comes back around and goes back up the Andes again. So it has a great chance to get vapor la loaded. And so we see lots and lots of, of water vapor into the air that then orographically uh, mountain lifting and then that dumps all of the snow there. And so that's why we have such huge, huge ice fields in this location. Climatologically, it's anomalous, it's wonderful. Um, climatologically, it's very similar to the Pacific Northwest. In fact, it is, the, you know, the, the, the climates are identical. You have cold water current off of the coast, you have uh, the, the uh, subtropical, the subpolar lows that influence the region, very, very similar to that. Feel free to interrupt. Wouldn't it be about as far south as Glacier National Park is north? Yes. So not that surprising to find glaciers there, really? Yes. Well, the glaciers in Glacier National Park are at a much higher altitude. These glaciers are only at about 1,200 feet. Yeah. The ice field itself has a mean elevation of maybe 7,000, 7,500 7, feet. So everything's on a much lower scale because you have so much snow. And so these outlet glaciers can exist, at a, and that's part of the story that we're gonna, gonna find out. So let me, let me uh, this, is, this is Lago Plomo here, Puerto Patrón is right here. This is, you take the Zodiac across here, Don Ramón's Estancia, come up to here. Here is uh, Rancho Palomar, and we're gonna go across this, we're gonna go across the outlet glaciers here and then come out down here. So you'll see this map a few times. Uh, this is going up the Solaire Valley. And we have two sets of research that, that my students are, are, are completing right now. Uh, I have one master's student that is, I'm editing his thesis at, as I go home tonight, I'm editing the master's thesis on some of the material you're gonna see here in a second. Uh, but this is Solaire Valley. This is Val, Val Solaire. And the, the uh, Val Solaire is, this is the ice field that's up in here. And you can see the Andes are a very young mountain range, very young mountain ranges are tectonically active, they're volcanically active in places as well. And so this is the, the, the Rio Solaire coming down and flowing into Lago Plomo. As we go on up, uh, up the valley here, so this is the area that we're looking at here in the inset map of the, the ice field. This is the Solaire Valley. Like so, and up at the top here, this would be the Northern Patagonia ice field up here. Uh, this is Lago Torbio, this nice long linear uh, lake right here. And this is Lago Largo, fat, fat lake, um, <laughs> large lake uh, here. And this is part of a very interesting little sequence. So what my, my student right now is, is looking at is we, there was a very, very large flood that occurred down this occurred down this uh, valley in 1989. And the end moraine here, this main end moraine here, uh, was breached and catastrophically the lake level dropped several meters. Uh, about, about 40 meters of water instantly came out here. We don't know what the triggering mechanism is. We think that there was an ice fall here and ice came into the, fell into the lake, generated a wave which overtopped the the, uh, the end moraine here 
and broke it down, and then the water drained catastrophically for three days out here. We call these, call these floods glacial lake outburst floods. So we know that this happened in 1989 because Don Ramon, Don Ramon was a witness to it. And he, uh, he, he speaks of it, and his friend was stuck in a tree for, for three days uh, up here. And he and his son ran to higher elevation. All they could feel was the wind and they knew something was up because the wind never comes from that direction, apparently. The, they were feeling it, and so they immediately ran up the hill. So uh, take a look at, uh, this, is a, this is three separate A, B, and C. C isn't very, very clear here. Uh, three different images here of what we're looking at. And so these are Landsat imagery with false color composite. And so the vegetation is in red here. And so this is, uh, in A, is the first, one of the first Landsat uh, images here. There's Lago Terbio and this is Lago Largo here. And you can see the volume of the lake is much greater in A. This is 1975 prior to uh, the glacial lake outburst flood. And you can see the entire valley here is also uh, very vegetated through here. This is just after the, uh, the, the flood in 1990. So this is the one after 1990. And the question then was, what, how big of a volume of water was this? We know that if you walk down here, and you'll see this in a, in a minute, you'll see there are boulders the sizes of houses that were moved by this flood. And so the question then begs, you know, how big was this? And did it happen in the past? And so what you're looking at here, this is the vegetation, uh, the, the lack of vegetation now. And then the pink here is uh, the, the difference in vegetation. So this is the amount uh, of, this is where the wall of water came down and took all the vegetation out. So. You can, you can take a, you can see all of that going on down. And you can see the, the light green is the change in volume from here to here. You can see that little change in volume. So that's kind of interesting. This is the, looking up to the north, uh, the Lago Largo would be over in this area here. Lago Torbio would be back in here. And you're looking straight up from where the wall of water came. And you can see these very, very large boulders that are being moved. And well, that's, that's impressive. Uh, this is Lago Turbio up here. Lago Largo would be over here. There's a person right there for a little bit of scale. This was all moved as bed load in this flood that came down. And so my, my graduate student set out to try to figure out. There were some Chilean uh, scientists who came up just after it, and they were estimating that the, they were estimating that the, uh, the volume of water was flowing probably at 20,000 cubic meters per second down here. Uh, we looked at this and we thought, uh-uh, it's going to take more than that. And so what my graduate student, Jonathan, Jonathan uh, uh, Burton, um, <coughs> Jonathan Burton has taken, uh, taken so, a look at, uh, uh, using G uh, GIS, you can see the old lake level here and here. And so he's taken imagery, uh, uh, some, some uh, digital elevation map imagery, calculated what the volume of water here is, is. We know how long that the water flowed out. And then using hydraulic equations based upon how large these are, boulders these are, and what it would take to get these things to move. John has come up with the idea that the volume was more like 55 to 60,000 cubic meters per second through here at peak flow. And so this was a very, very large, large flood. Um, and this was the one in 1989. We know with earlier, question? Well, wouldn't it be more of a slurry of stuff like mud and rocks and gravel and big little stones growing up to big stones that move those boulders and then a lot of the stuff is washed away? And that's sort of at the end of the flood, so you really can't see a lot of the... Yeah, well, exactly, and, and, and you're right. Uh, but we have a natural finding process that's going on. So there is, at, at the end of one of the turns, all of these large materials is just dumped. And there's a fairly, fairly interesting, you know, point where, where this material is dumped, and then we start getting the fine. So it's a finding process that's going on. And so this is where he's measuring for the, the 55,000 CMS in this area. But you're right, that material did get washed and flooded out down, down lower on. Well, but the big stuff was carried by the little stuff. It wasn't just water, it was yep. everything. Yeah, that's, okay. that's so true. What do they call that? Uh, I guess slurry is the right term. Yeah. Uh, 
Sort of like a pyroclastic uh, flow except for water instead of heated air. Yeah, yeah. The, this was mainly a, a big, big catastrophic wall of water that came down. Now, this was, I, I agree with you. I think that that slurry would have been more of an effect further down. But this is within probably, this is probably within uh, uh, a kilometer or two of the breach. And so this is this is the, the the lowering of the water. This picture here is just this area right here. So you're taking a look at. So you're looking up up way here. This is where we think there was probably a probably a piece of uh, an ice fall or something like that that came in, generate a wave that 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 topped the uh, the moraine. Uh, the moraine which went across right across through here. The moraine, the the stream, the outlet stream was already flowing over the top, and so the it was probably a fairly weak little area to begin with, and then the wave then just finished it off. So this again, uh, this again is looking at the ice and glacier trail in and of itself. Lago Plomo here. Uh, this would be uh, Lago uh, getting back on track to. We're going to head to the other area that we're doing research as well. So that's that's one thing. We know that there was probably another. Uh, another glof probably earlier in the 1950s and 60s around uh, the Solaire Valley. So we're trying to, to figure that out. What I would like to do and what I think that Jonathan, my, my current master student and soon to be PhD student, uh, want to do is take a look at this and maybe core Lago Plomo because we'd be able to tell evidence of all past gloffs that came down the valley and then take some sediment cores as you move on up. So that's that's his goal for his PhD is to take a look at, at that and uh, this is logged this is uh, um, enclosed by a Pleistocene a Pleistocene in moraine here so and during the Pleistocene 20, 24,000 years ago ice filled this entire valley and that's the the end moraine from the the terminal moraine from the Pleistocene right around the end of Lago Plomo and you can see the the opaqueness the opacity of the water here versus the Green Bacher River here that's flowing by. So this is all glacial glacials, till, and sediment that is uh, making the water a little bit more opaque. Yes. How long is the trail in kilometers and days? The 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 trail. This trail here is about 120 kilometers in length, and generally take two weeks to do it. You can do it. I did it faster. I did it the first time we did it in March with Manuel. Uh, we did it in we did it during spring break. And so we did it in seven days. But we were, we were hiking from basically 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. So we were really, really moving along. I wanted to see, before I would take any students here, I wanted to go through it myself you know, first to see what, what, what all is here. And, and you know, he kept saying, are you all right? Are you all right? And I said, Manuel, am I smiling? He says, yes. He goes, you're always smiling. I said, if I'm smiling, he goes, I'm fine. So, uh, you know, and. and <laughs> And that's that became a running gag with me. You know, are you all right? I said, Am I smiling? Yeah. So this is uh, uh, this is the Neff Outlet Glacier here, and the Neff part of the Neff is what we think fell into Lago uh, Lago Largo uh, over here. So uh, this is the Neff Glacier as we cr and so we'll cross that, then we'll go down through here, and then this is the Colonia Glacier right here, Colonia Outlet Glacier. These elevations, as high as you're going to get here, is only about um, using English units, uh, only about 2,200 feet high at the highest point. Down here at the end of uh, at the end of the Colonia and Lago Colonia, right down here, you're sitting at about 1,000, 1,200 feet. So this was all covered with ice at one point. Okay. This is our first, my first trip through here, and as I mentioned, it was March, and so it was a changing season there. And we had uh, very, very poor weather as we crossed this, uh, and the rain was coming. We actually had thunderstorms, and thunderstorms, if you know anything about Seattle, it's not very, they don't get very, a lot of thunderstorms like we get here. Same thing, they're rarities in, in this portion of, uh, of South America as well, but we had uh, lightning crossing this glacier. The glacier now is, is about uh, uh, 10 kilometers wide, six miles, six miles wide where we cross it, and we're headed off into this. Uh, it looks like something out of Mordor or something like that. <laughs> it's headed to the two towers, I don't know. Uh, but this is us crossing. 
and uh, this is looking back up up the glacier, the, up the Neff Glacier. The ice field itself is back up on this plateau, up in this area. This is the Outlet Glacier. Lago Largo would be uh, beyond, just beyond this uh, uh, this peak right here. So you have to take two weeks of supplies and uh, Actually, we have we had guides. We had guides with us, and Jonathan. Jonathan Leidick, I know too many Jonathans in this story, uh, but Jonathan Leidick, the guy from Evergreen who set this whole thing up, has five camps along the way. And they have a little bit of shelters in them, and he's got a series of five gallon drums, or 50 gallon drums that he's, 30 gallon drums that he's has filled with some supplies. And so they supply them early in the season, then take them out late in the season, and that's how. That's how they negotiate some of this. And he's a major employer of the youth of Puerto Patron, and so they love him greatly because in Chile you have generally two careers, military or the copper mines, and that's it. So to be able to work in tourism is a bonus. And so he's got some really great, great guys and, 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 and uh, ladies that work for him. So everybody, everybody pitches in and, and uh, he, he pays them well, and they do very, very well on tips as well. So. When you're walking across the snow and ice, is, is the crust rigid and firm enough that you don't have to walk it? Oh, oh this no, this is this. Yeah, this is this is this is just ice. It's very solid, very solid. You know, you're not. In fact, you need to have crampons, little spikes that you put on as you walk across it. Um, at the end, I'll, I'll show you a, a picture. This is some of the worst stuff that I have ever hiked on in my life. This is ice cored moraine. And so you have this thin veneer of, of, uh, of clay, silt, uh, rocks, and things like that that's maybe mm, a couple of centimeters, a couple of inches thick, and then it's ice. And when it was raining, this stuff becomes treacherously slippery, and it's just absolutely the worst stuff I've ever hiked on. And I've, I, I've done it three times now, and each time I keep saying, I'm never doing this again. Um, it's just, it takes, to go from the edge of the, the ice across to where we're going to end up, it takes, uh, it, it takes a two, three hours just to get across that little small half mile wide piece of uh, stuff. So the year that we took the students, uh, when, we, when Manuel and I went up in March, we were able to walk right up the river valley here. But when we took the students in December uh, a couple of years back, uh, this uh, the Solaire River was was really cranking, and so we couldn't hike that way. And so the alternate route is up here, and this is just as treacherous. So it's not an easy journey at all. And uh, we, in fact, we when we uh, take the students, we interview them to see what kind of uh, background they have in terms of being able to to do something like this. And and we take them on. Uh, you know, test hikes, you know, up to uh, St. Mary's Glacier area, up that little couloir, and see how well they, they can handle just doing off-trail stuff. And, well, we've had to turn down a couple of people, and there's been some people that have absolutely surprised the heck out of me. That, you know, yeah, you know, this, this one lady, um, I was absolutely sure there was no way that she was going to make it. And she ran, she ran rings around me. She was just, you know, I'm going. And she was... She was a little overweight. She was, you know, didn't look like she was in shape, and you know, and she, on the on the on the test hikes and things, she really wasn't overwhelming Manuel or myself with her abilities. And yet she get down there, and she's just all over the place. It was amazing. So this is it's a it's an interesting little area. Uh, this is crossing the ice, going going across the Neff Glacier, looking back uh, looking back and up there. These crevasses. Uh, these crevasses are very, very deep, and so you have to be very, very careful. Um, one of the things that I learned on the Juno Ice Field, uh, working up there in the in the 90s, was when you have snow on this, you have to be very, very, very careful, and you look for just little subtle nuances in the shading of the snow to fi figure out where these crevasses are. And so it's a it's a it's a learned technique. Of course, when you're just like this, and it's just uh, ice piece of cake you just avoid it but it takes a while to get across this is a 14 hour day on the day that we cross the Neff Glacier so it's a long long day and this is one of our first videos here so we took a drone with us this last time and so by taking the drone I apologize for the the the, the, the shakiness of it there we are down here 
This is where we're headed. This is where this is that ice cored moraine that I told you was the worst stuff on the planet. Uh, so we have to hike our way over into here. We this is our what we head for, and then come, kick up to the left there. You can see this. This is called a trim line, and the trim line marks the greatest uh, extent where the ice used to be. And that trim line is very important because it tells us, gives us an idea of how thick the ice was uh, way back when. And it's not way back when. This is the this is the marker for the the last little ice age marker for this region. And this ice this ice is 240 meters lower. 240 meters times three. What's that, Clyde? 240 meters, 800 feet, about. Yeah. About 800 feet. So we've lost we've lost 240 meters of ice uh, uh, since the maximum time here. The Little Ice Age in this region was thought to be maxed out at about 1650. So, what's that? 300, 400 years ago. So this is thinning at a very, very, very rapid rate, and this is accelerated. Uh, to date. So this is where we came from. This is uh, uh, Palomar's is that direction. So now comes the fun part. We're going to see if we can see if this is going to... Oh, it worked. It worked. Woo! Awesome. Um, you can see all of this crevassing and uh, uh, seracs and things. These, this has caused uh, the surface crevassing that you see here that were so chaotic like this. This is caused by, by stress underneath the ice. So there have to be outcrops of bedrock underneath the ice that the ice is flowing over. I'll show you a better view in a little bit later. Uh, but if you see this kind of ice, you know that there is traumatic bedrock outcrops underneath the ice that the ice is having to flow around and the stresses then gets translated and demonstrated on the, on the surface of the ice. This is absolutely impassable. You cannot cross that. Uh, this is probably uh, a good three meters from there to there. Yeah. There's our happy group. The weather was a little bit better the time we crossed the ice than the first time I went with the thunder and lightning. And so there's our, our happy group and the ice, uh, the ice field itself is up there and this is the Neff out Outlet Glacier. There's one of the crevasses or moulons and so this is another feature that you have to worry about. Uh, these are called ice mills or moulons and moulons they go straight to the bottom of the glacier. So this, the water actually works at it and it flows all the way. These things can be uh, these things can be thousands of feet deep here. So whereas you break a leg, you break an arm, you break your neck falling into a crevasse, you fall into one of these, you're going to end up being like the uh, Bronze Age guy that came out of the Swiss glacier, uh, Italian glacier a few years back. Uh, that's, that's, uh, those aren't fun. Uh, up on the Juno ice field, there was a very large round one and I volunteered to be lowered down into one and the water is constantly coming down so you put the rain suit on and go down. I got down about 50 feet and I got just so claustrophobic I had had to yell pull me up. It's cold, it's dark and it, it, I'm glad I did it but I would never do it again. It's just... <laughs> The oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do certainly. They they'll actually what they'll do is sometimes they'll throw some dyes down there, uh, some radioactive dyes, and follow trying to understand what the plumbing system is of the glaciers. So there's all sorts of internal, uh, in glacial in glacial streams, subglacial streams, superglacial streams, all sorts. They have their own plumbing systems. The, these things, and so they're really quite quite interesting. Uh, students always have to do work when they're out on my trips, so they're busy after lunch. Writing, uh, writing their findings and, and doing some stuff. So we keep them busy all the time. At night, have some fun with laser pointers. This laser pointer, for example, was caused all of this. So a little time-lapse photography and around the campfire. We always bring uh, a, a portable, portable awning because it rains a lot, just like it does in the Pacific Northwest. It's almost always constantly raining. So that's another, another factor in trying to keep dry. Uh, this is the Neff Glacier that we just crossed, and this is the uh, uh, <coughs> Lago Espiojo, uh, and this is this is an area where the ice during the Pleistocene came across here. You can see the trim line here, and even during the Little Ice Age, it was probably high enough to get to this point. Pleistocene, it certainly went across. Uh, as we move and turn around a little bit, uh, you'll see that this used to be a finger of the the a finger of the Neff Glacier here flowed towards this direction through here. And so these are all just kind of recessional moraines as that ice, as the, the Neff, this finger of the Neff Glacier retreated back and everything melted down. 
you can see the trim line there as it kind of disappears right there. So you can see where the, the Little Ice Age, about 1600, uh, 350 years ago or so, ended right about there. Now during the Pleistocene, the ice was much thicker. We don't see uh, the remnants of, the, uh, of, of the, the trim lines from Pleistocene glaciation are long since eroded away. So we don't see any evidence from those 20,000 years ago. We do have evidence from, from the 400 years ago, 300, 400 years ago, and that's it right there. But these are all just little recessionals. That's this finger of the, this finger of the Neff Glacier, and you can see where the trim line is there. So it used to be up that high, flowed this direction, and this finger then went down and as, this, uh, as the drone turns to the right a little bit, as we get to the end here, uh, you'll see this little canyon. Oops, it's for me, I'm not here. <laughs> um, it flowed down into, into where the Colonia gla Outlet Glacier was. So at one time, at one time in the Pleistocene, ice filled this entire area and the, the Neff and the Colonia Outlet Glaciers were joined at one point. And so as this comes around, hopefully, that little flickering's kind of, there we go, come on, we're getting to the, close to the end of, these things are not more than a minute or so old, long. Okay, right here, the ice flowed down through this, and the, these uh, granitic uh, uh, peaks here are like uh, El Capitan. So these are very, very high, they're huge. And this little valley right here, the ice went through here, and then down into the Colonia Glacier. And these are all little recessional moraines as the ice retreated within the last 100 years. So, in the last, 100 years? last 100 years, yes. So you can get the idea that things change here rather rapidly. And where we're going to go next in the next big area where we're doing research really brings that point home. So where we're going next is this is Lago Plomo. This is this is the we just crossed the Neff Glacier, and uh, this is the area that little canyon, the little canyon where the ice there's the Lago Espiojo is here, and so if we go down here, this is where the ice came during the Pleistocene through here, and this was connected. So the Neff was connected to the Colonia Glacier through this canyon. This is the El Capitan range uh, of peaks, kind of like right here, very narrow valley. Uh, at this point, you are two weeks away from anything. And fewer than 100 people have ever been in this area in the history of the planet, in this region. There's not many places that you can go where you can say that you're one of, one of a, a 100 or 200 people th that have been able to go through there. Uh, it's a very magical place. It's all virgin timber, hasn't been touched. When we go through this area here, we we try to maintain as little of an impact as possible. The guides keep us all on, try to keep us to one meter wide through the entire canyon. And we don't speak as we go through this. It's very, you know, it's just a, it's a, a, it's a revered place and everybody tries to keep it, keep it that way. And so there's no talking. We just walk through and you have it to yourself. And we make that announcement before we leave, before we leave camp here to, to before we leave camp here to walk through this, we just say, we're going to have a couple of hours of quiet time as we go through here and you know, explain what's going on. And this is as far away from civilization as you probably will ever get. So we're going to head to this area here. And you can see this is the Colonia Glacier, Outlet Glacier here. And there's a little lake back in here. And this is called Lago Cachet Dos. Lago Cachet Uno is up here. There used to be joined just uh, Lago Cachet. Uh, but in 1940, there was a, a Gloff event that occurred here. And so a Gloff event, uh, this lake catastrophically drained out, then down and down to this uh, region right here, causing this river to flow backwards for two days as the water came out of, of, of this, this uh, out of the, the Cachet Dos Basin here. Uh, at that point, there was headwater erosion here and separated Cachet Dos and Cachet Uno. Uh, forever at this stage of the game. So these are two, two separate areas here. So after 1940, Cachet Dos didn't gloff anymore, didn't glacial lake outburst flood, stopped. And so there wasn't any kind of activity out of this. The Colonia Glacier dammed this up very solidly. The lake filled up. The lake the sediments flowed into here. And then in 2008, suddenly, it started to have glacial lake outburst flood events again. First once a year, then twice a year, 
And then from the period of 2009 until just last year, they would happen two to three times a summer, summer being uh, our winter time. So between basically from November until March, there would, the lake would, would refill catastrophically, pour out, and then uh, the, as the glacier moved in, the theory, the theory for why you would have this periodicity is there would have to be weaknesses in the ice that the water then could exploit. And so our idea is that we had crevasses that translated, translated into position here. The water would then eat away at it and then break into the plumbing system, the inglacial plumbing system of the Colonia Glacier, and that water would then flow catastrophically out into Lago Colonia down here, uh, and uh, the, the lake would drain. And then as more solid ice moved across the across the uh, the channel here, across the basin here, the lake would seal up, the seal up, fill up again until another weak weak point of the ice would come through, in which case it would, it would empty again. So the series of the series of uh, of Gloth events uh, really started people thinking about what's going on in terms of of this portion of the ice field because clearly something had changed. There was a big event in 1940 then nothing, and then suddenly in 2008 we start seeing this sequence of, of glacial lake outburst floods. And for the people down here, the people, the, the farmers and, and the ranchos that were down here, they lost sheep, they lost cattle. Uh, mercifully, there weren't any loss of human life, uh, but there was a need then to try to establish some sort of alert or signal that would, you know, let them know that there was a wall of water coming so that they could you know, move the animals out of the low-lying pastures and, and get them to higher ground. So that got established back in, in 20, 2010. They started to, to get that up there, uh, that alert thing. So that's, uh, that was in place. Uh, it lasted for a year and a half, two years, and then it went geschwinkto, and uh, so it hasn't been replaced since then. So now everybody just realizes, okay, uh, the, the Rio Colonia will experience flooding sometimes and so in the summertime uh, down there they try to keep all of their 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 uh, uh, cattle and, and sheep at on higher higher pastures this is a, a look at uh, uh, Landsat imagery of Lago Casa dos Lago Casa Uno up here where it's dammed and here's where it is drained and so you can see that there's a, a nice little volume of water that exists in this basin and during the period from 1940 until uh, 2008, all that you had coming into here, you bring all of this sediment from the surrounding areas would come in and fill, fill the uh, the basin here with sediment. So you got all sorts of neat little sediment uh, accumulations through here. And then starting in 2008, whenever these things would empty, those rivers then downcut through all the sediment, the, the sediment that was put in place uh, prior to uh, the last time. And so here you can see some of this. This is an old delta in here, right here, and you can see the incisions that have taken place. Uh, the river's now down here. This is where the old lake used, lake level used to be, the lake bed, that's now been incised. But this is not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is this stuff down here. And you can see them here as well. There's the Colonia Glacier where the ice dam comes across in this area. But this is what we're looking at. There's the ice dam right here. What is this? They're old linga trees. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's really cool. So there's old trees here that were buried, that were buried by the inundation of, by the damming of the, uh, of the, uh, the little stream through here that filled up the lake and formed Lago Cachet Dos. How old are they? Well, carbon dating and other dating tells us that these trees, there was full forest in here 800 to 1100 years ago. Okay, what does that mean? Hmm. What does it mean? It means that that piece of ice wasn't there 800 to 1100 years ago because that stream was able to flow out of this valley unimpeded and allowed the Linga forest to come down and populate this entire valley. So suddenly things get a lot more interesting around here. And you can think of Colonia Glacier being a canary in the coal mine then. Because clearly this glacier then reacts very, very quickly to climate change. Very, very quickly. 
So 800 to 1100 years ago, that piece of ice wasn't there. It was up, up valley, had to be, had to be. We had a Linga forest for two, 300 years here. And then 800 years ago, the onset of the Little Ice Age in this region, the glacier expands on down valley, blocks up this little outlet valley, the lake fills, and it stays filled until 1940. And then stays filled another 60 years, 68 years, until 2008. So now we've got a real interesting situation here. This is, now we're cooking. This is great stuff, yeah. Is that correspondent from the Scandinavians who are doing their exploring of Iceland and Greenland and I don't know. Scotland. I don't know the answer. Was it? Then probably you're right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, then probably contemporaneous with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you look at this and you can see all, you can see all of these little layers. These are, this is all, and as, as time goes on, we're seeing more and more trees as we incise more down through the old lacustre and old lake sediments here. We see more and more trees appearing as you get further and further down towards that area. There's some more there. This is just a, it's fun to run down this because it's all sand and stuff. So you can just kind of dig your heels in and run from the little plateau here. You just go boom, boom, boom and get down to the bottom here fairly quickly. But it's, it's kind of fun. This is the lake filling up after a, a, a recent glow off in 20, uh, 2016, 2017. The dam is reformed and uh, uh, the water is starting to refill again in, into Lago Casa Dos. Remember I showed you, I told you about uh, uh, these bedrock outcrops that caused the tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous uh, stresses and, and the, the huge crevassing. Uh, this is a great example of where you can see that. Here's the outcrop here. The ice has to flow up and over it and you can see all the, the chaotic, chaotic ice there. Never seen a better place where this is demonstrated, where you can actually see the bedrock outcrop. It's like someone took a, a, a knife and, and cut it across there so, you could, so we could, could see all of this. Really, really quite interesting. Okay, what about that drainage? Well, we had our drone with us, and the tunnel was open when we were there a couple of years ago. And so I had my student fly the drone into the tunnel. And you can see the water is flowing in. It makes a quick left here. Down Glacier is over here. Lago Colonia is down this way. Up Glacier is to the right. And so the water is coming in like so, and then making a hard left into the internal plumbing system of the glacier here. So all of this was formed by the, by the, uh, the, the, the GLOF, the most recent GLOF prior to us flying into here. You can see that it's already starting to collapse. You can see the collapses collapsing down there. And as he flies in there, I don't fly these things because I'm chicken. Then um, <laughs> I'm going to crash them. Uh, you'll see a couple of interesting things that happen, number one. Uh, as he goes in and goes in, there's this big outcrop roll here. That's what's forcing the, the all water. It's a little light in here, so you can't really see it too well, but I'll narrate and tell you what's going on. But as he flies further in, you'll start to see drops of water coming off of the, off of the roof. And when we start to see that on the monitor there, you'll start to see it over here. I tell, I tell Eric, my pilot, to get the heck out of there because if you've got water that drips into the motors, the rotors of the drone, uh, suddenly you don't have a drone anymore. And it goes into the, into the plumbing of the, of the glacier. So as we get in, for, he's going in deeper. Watch out. But this melting then, there it is. See the drops of water? The drops of water, so I'm telling him get out. So he's got to turn around. And then we get hit by a catabatic wind. Catabatic winds are, are air that's cooled on the glacier surface is denser. And so it flows downhill and it falls off onto this and almost blew the drone right into the side of the, of the ice here. So we're getting perilously close to, the, to that. And then we take it on up. You can see the rotors of the, uh, the, the drone. We're sitting up here, up here. And so this is the, uh, the drainage. First, to our knowledge, first time anybody's ever flown into a, a glacial lake outburst tunnel through there. We didn't go very deep into it, but uh, we'll, take the, we'll take the first. How do you recharge your drone in two weeks? That's, that's a, that's, we have solar panels. We have solar panels, yeah. What we have is we have these big Yeti, uh, Yeti power, power, basically big, 
big batteries. And so we charge the batteries up at camp all day long with the solar panels that we put in series. Those, those get charged up and then uh, they can put out 110, 110 to 220 voltage and we charge up the batteries at night. And we found, we were, we were afraid that we, were, we, were, we weren't going to have enough power. We had two of the Yetis, um, but we didn't need them. And so uh, the students were able to charge their phones, lucky us. Uh, they didn't have cell service there, but they had, they could listen to their music. So <laughs> that was, they were happy that they had a little extra, extra battery juice for that. Uh, this is looking at the surface where that chaotic, there's the outcrop there, give you a little bit better view up here. This is the Colonia Glacier looking upwards uh, to the ice field. Another uh, view here, there's that chaotic. Ice used to extend all the way across here. This is Lago Cache at Dos coming up on the right hand side. You can see the uh, where it is now, but this is all glacially polished here. This is the valley. You can see the old lake lines at this stage here. The water is flowing out. Um, and as we pan around, as we go on further up and pan to the right, you can see all the different layers of lacustrine sediments that occurred that have been, uh, that have been incised uh, through the past, uh, past 10 years. And then as we look down, when the ice dam is in effect, the water goes down this. So when the ice, when the, when the ice dam is, is full and the, uh, when the ice dam is blocking this, the water pills up in the lake and then starts to flow down this way and that lake isn't nearly as blue. It's all muddy and nasty and the water goes on the left side of that divide. So here's the, you can see the trim line from the uh, the, the Colonia Glacier as well, ice field up here, uh, chaotic and so, so all of this neat stuff like so. I think that's it for that one. Nope. Not sure why I lingered on that. Oh, I wanted to show this little ice fall here. There we go. So there's more of that, uh, that outcrop. Um, that's a person there for scale just to give you a, a huge overview of this region, little tributary glaciers coming in. Okay. Get worn down. What's that? The old glacier wears them down. Yes, it does. More, very, very true. So here's, here's where we are now. This is the Lago Cache at Dos. And so we're hiking now down through this little section through here. This is uh, uh, heading back that way. And just to show you uh, a little bit more of, of all of this. So the internal plumbing of the glacier comes down through here and it exits on the left side of the glacier into this. When the flood occurs, when we have a glacial lake outburst flood here, we know that the water comes out on the left side of the glacier. When it is dammed up, the water, and the water isn't going through the ice, it's coming down through here and this way through. So it has two different pathways to get out. So if the, if the, uh, the, the, the dam isn't working, the water flows through the plumbing of the glacier. When the dam is working, the, the water flows out this way. And this is that little lake we call this Lago Cancun uh, <laughs> because we had great weather. The, the temperature was about 70 degrees. Uh, and you can see how fast, uh, as I said, when the water's flowing down through this direction, it's very muddy and opaque and, and just a, a nasty little lake. But when it is not, when the dam is, is open and the water is flowing under the glacier, we have a beautiful little place to spend a day or two to recharge one's personal batteries here. And so this lake, the Lago Casa Dos is back that way. And this is this beautiful little lake that exists here and nice sandy beach. Uh, you can see our camp encampment here on the sand. Beautiful. Um, there's, there's, some, uh, there's our main camp in this area. So we put things up here and uh, uh, a couple of things to show you. You'll get a better, much better overview of, of this scene here in a second when we pan the camera back up. And uh, Lago Cachet Dos is there. So I'm going to pan to the left. There's the Lago Colonia. And so the water comes down right down through there. When the dam is working, the water comes in through here. And then now you can see a little, little delta there almost uh, th th where the water comes through. Uh, but when the, when the dam is open like it was when we were there, the water flies flows underneath the, uh, underneath the colonia. Uh, this is the terminus of the colonia. And just to uh, give you an idea, uh, when I first started my first trip with Manuel back in uh, 2015, uh, the terminus was up here, up here. So it's already retreated back that far in a couple of years. This is uh, Arco Glacier, Glacier Arco back 
here, so gloffed until the 1960s. So uh, as the colonia came across here in the 1950s and 60s, it caused this this canyon to gloff. And so that stopped. So we know this the, the colonia retreated, uh, wasn't able to dam this up anymore after 1960, 65, I believe it was, in this area here. And now it's, this is retreating backwards even further. Again, you can see this trim line, the 240 meters, very similar to what we saw what we saw with uh, uh, the Neff Glacier. Oh, yeah, this, this is the Arco, Arco Glacier here. A lot of icebergs here. Uh, this is uh, just my uh, two, two graduate students are flying the, uh, flying the drone. And I happened upon them just in the nick of time. They had decided they were going to land on one of the icebergs. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> They wanted to land. Oh, it's, they'll be perfectly safe. I'm going, no, we're not going to do that. So they didn't do that after all. But uh, these are all icebergs here. And at this point, we get hike over to this area here where you hop on another zodiac, go across Lago Colonia, and come out at Sol de Mayo at the end of the, at the, end of the 120 kilometer ice and glacier trail. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the proglacial lake of that area. Uh, once you get out, this is the this is the uh, this is the um, confluence of the uh, Rio Neff and the Colonia, the the Colonia Glacier here, and this will give you a little bit better view of it all. And so this water comes down here. Uh, this is the Rio Neff, the Rio Colonia, and they form the Greenbacher River. So that how that's how all of it all comes together. You get the the the, the Neff Rio Neff Rio uh, Colonia, they join up. Uh, when this, when the colonia gloffs, this river flows backwards. So this river flows backwards and, and up the valley a little bit. Uh, so this is uh, the the the. I wish I had sound with this because it would be deafening. The 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 amount and volume of water that is coming off of this is truly astounding. You can understand why they would want to build dams, hydroelectric dams, down here because it's a never-ending supply of electricity. But as you've seen. What do you lose from that? You lose a lot. You lose a lot of spectacular scenery uh, that is absolutely uh, probably one of the most magical places I've ever been. So we'll let this come around. Um, what you'll see with the uh, Colonia, as we pan, ac pan across to the Colonia, you'll see the opacity of that water that's joining in, that water that's joining in with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the Neff. So, the proximity is not necessarily that the Neff Glacier isn't eroding, it's that there has been a more time. This, this, this glacier, is, this uh, river is further away from the terminus of the Neff than the Colonia is from the, uh, Colonia is from, uh, uh, the terminus of the Colonia. So where do we come into this? Last part. I talked a long time, I apologize. Uh, where do we come in? So remember this? So we talked about, we talked about the uh, uh, Vostok ice core, and you can see temperatures go up, temperatures go down, and uh, we have the, we have some climate change deniers in our current administration, and they say, well, the climate's always changed, and they're right, the climate has always changed. So we see the carbon dioxide uh, upwards of almost 300 parts per million, 300 parts per million upwards in a couple of places here, and you can see that there's a nice agreement with the uh, you know temperatures go up, carbon dioxide goes up or carbon dioxide goes up, temperatures go up, vice versa, decline, temperatures go down. Is this the Rosetta Stone for climate change? No, because if you look really, really closely, you can find times when it's, it's hard to say the chicken or the egg with all of this. So does temperature rise uh, cause the CO2 rise or does CO2 rise cause the temperature to rise? Because you can find occasions such as right here where uh, the, actually, the temperature is going up while the CO2 goes down. You can find other occasions where, where there's some options. So if you take a close look, but the overall, you take a look, you go, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. And so this was the, this was the first real good uh, nail in the coffin that there was a, a, good, uh, a good correlation between greenhouse gases and temperature that came out of this. Antarctica. This was Antarctica, yeah, Vostok, Antarctica. <coughs> yep. Okay. So 300 parts per million, that's the historic. So there's your there's your natural climate change. This is kind of a reversal of the of the of the degree of the uh, graph, the previous one. Now we look where we are today. 
we're up here today, I checked it right before we came in, before I came in, we're at 414 parts per million today. 414 parts per million. I don't see 414 parts per million over the last uh, uh, 400,000. That We can even extend that back to 800,000. Basically, last million years, we have never seen CO2 at the levels that we're seeing it today. Okay, what does that have to do with the price of fish, and what does that have to do with Colorado, and what does that have to do with Patagonia? Here's our global temperatures that are that are warming up, and so you can see this little up step right here, uptick right here. These are these are global temperatures, so we're looking both at the northern and southern hemisphere. Remember, I told you the glow started again in 2008. Okay, this region in South America warmed up even more rapidly than that, and so we've seen an acceleration of melting on the Colonia Glacier that hadn't been seen before, and what it did was it allowed that ice dam to become more porous and to become more fragile and to become more impermanent. And so consequently, you see the past from 2008 until 2018, we had 10 years of glow cycle. And I keep saying in the past tense, why? Last December, last December there was a collapse of that left side of the Colonia Glacier. It dropped it dropped about 100 meters, so about 300 feet. We're assuming that that was a collapse of the uh, collapse of the internal plumbing of that glacier, and so since that collapse occurred in December of of, uh, of uh, 20, 2017, it was we have not had any more gloves there. Lago Cachet Dos is no more. It's stream Cachet Dos, so that doesn't exist, and we know. We know that if you go back 800 to 1,000 to 1,100 years ago, we know that there wasn't any ice dam there then, right? Because we had linga forest there, right? Wow. So this really is an incredible cli dynamic, cl climatologically dynamic area. This place is so... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I, it's so responsive so responsive to climate change here. So clearly, and, and 1,100 years geologically, that's nothing. That's no time at all. And so all of this changed. So we know that there, that there was no ice dam 1,100 to 800 years ago. We know that there was an ice dam from about 800 years ago until about 1940. And we know that starting in 20, oh, 2008, we started getting gloffs again. And now we've had collapse and we don't have an ice dam again. Everything's going on. So this, in a span of 1,200 years, we've seen at least two cycles. Amazing. Things like that don't happen that fast, naturally. So that, this is the extent of the Pleistocene ice cap down here, about 23,000 years ago. So, uh, and that's stretching up to about 35 degrees south latitude. It's a very large ice cap in here because as I mentioned, once the air exits from this side, the east coast of South America, it goes all the way around the world before it comes back and touches land again down here. So lots of vapor loading can go on. This is Rocky Mountain National Park about 18,000 years ago. This is a reconstruction uh, by the uh, National Park Service of what the glaciers look like in Rocky Mountain National Park. Very similar to what we see in Patagonia in terms of the ice field and ice cap along the, the, the divide here and these outlet glaciers that existed in, in this region, like so. So this is the Middle Pinedale Glaciation, is the, the local name for this. And if we take a look, there's, this is what it looks like today. So that's the same scale right here, and then looking at now, and you can see the old valleys and things that used to be covered with ice, right? And we can, you've all seen pictures like this of, of Rocky Mountain National Park with a nice parabolic glacially drained valley through here. Uh, other pictures of, of glacial, glacially carved features, Andrews Glacier down here, uh, Tyndall Lake down here, if you're familiar with the region, like so, these little wind drift glaciers that exist now. Let's take a look at this. So this is what Rocky Mountain National Park looked like 18,000 years ago. Inside this box is about the same, the same width of that and that. And so here's the Patagonia, Northern Patagonia ice field. Look at the similarities between these two. We can look at it a little closer. These are equivalent. 
And you can see nice little ice field there, nice little ice field. So if you want to see what this area would look like deglaciated, take all the ice out of it, go up to Rocky Mountain National Park. Go up to Rocky Mountain National Park, you can see. It's estimated that that Colonia Glacier has a thickness of about 1,200 meters, so about 3,500 feet thick. So take out Colonia Glacier, take out the Neff Glacier, you have Yosemite. You have Al Capitans, all of that. So if you want to see, if you want to see what Rocky Mountain National Park looked like 25 to 23,000 years ago, go to Patagonia. You want to see what this looks like now. And that's where we are. Climate change has scales. They're spatial, they're global, they're regional, they're local, and they're timely. Very, very timely. Thanks for listening. We'll leave that with a condor flying away. Sorry, I was so, ver so verbose. <laughs> yeah. How much snow and ice is being added to that area every year? It's losing. Well, okay, net losing, but how much comes oh. in? Uh, this year, this year was a very, very good year for that. They had, uh, let's see, I think they were telling me that they had uh, about 10 meters of snow this year. So they had a very, very good, very, very good year. The previous couple of years, though, very much like along here, uh, we we were just coming out of drought here. So it's, it's been the 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 uh, um, the uh, um, climate similarities have been fairly similar of late, coincidentally, you know, coincidentally, but but fairly, fairly good. You had a question? Okay. Yeah. Good question. Um, very similar to how it affects us. So you know, when they have a uh, they typically have a, a cold current, the Peru current, which flows off of the coast of, of Chile there. Uh, and when they get the when they get the uh, uh, the southern oscillation, the El Nino effect there, they get a northern uh, a more northerly push of the uh, the uh, polar front jet stream from the south. So they get affected by that as well. And so it's thought that perhaps the El Nino effect was was there as well this year as it was last. But a lot of times the El Nino doesn't last for an entire year, so you don't really get to, to compare the two. This has been an exceptionally, not a very strong El Nino, but it's been a persistent El Nino, the one we're currently in. Yeah? Is there access to the western side, Pacific side of the nation? Um, we do have access. We, ha we haven't been there yet. We're looking, we've got, we have some, we have proposals into the National Science Foundation for IRES grants, which are international research educational opportunities for students. And so as part of that, as part of that proposal, we want to bring students and start looking at other, other portions of the ice field because it, it hasn't been examined and, and it's clear to us now that this is really is a canary in the coal mine in terms of climate change. And we can really learn a lot from this region that we don't know. And we don't, right now, it's not, clear to us whether the climate changes that are going on in the southern Patagonia ice field are, are the same as those in the northern Patagonia ice field. They may be, in fact, it, it, the latest research that we're seeing, it seems that they, they are, are different. They're offset, they're, they're, they're not congruent. Yeah. Yes? How far back would you have to go to find uh, concentrations of CO2 in like what we have now? I don't know because we haven't found it. The, the, the most, the most that we have, we've seen is about 300 parts per million. So we're 25 percent over that. Okay. I mean, I, I know there's supposed to be a large uh, CO2 event at the uh, Eocene just before the Eocene thermal maximum. We uh, we can postulate. We don't have evidence for it that I'm aware that I'm aware of. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but I'm not aware of it. Are you aware, Clyde, at all? Yes. So if this, this region is the canary in the climatological mm -hmm. line, what are the larger ramifications for climate change and how it's going to impact us? Yeah. And, we, we know that the Greenland, the Greenland ice sheet, which is the second largest, is melting at a phenomenal rate. Really, really melting rapidly. Antarctica is, is melting rapidly. One of the things that, that 
was predicted and appears to be unfortunately coming true is the greatest amount of warming appears to be occurring in the polar and Arctic and Antarctic regions. So the warming in the Arctic, in fact I just read an article today about warming in the Arctic was, was much more rapid than was even postulated to occur 10 years ago. So it's happening and not certain why. Uh, it could be because we have lots of methane that's being released from the melting tundra and permafrost. So it could be concentrating, that's one idea, is that you're concentrating more greenhouse gas up into the polar regions by this outga outgassing from the tundra. Yeah. Has anybody applied remote sensing to your knowledge, um, analyzed the size of those meltwaters, those pools that form after you get the methane hydrate release in those regions? I don't know. I you know I I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. I'd be I'd be interested too. Great question. Yes. You mentioned the uh, southern jet stream. Is that going right across that? Yep. Country? Yep. Yeah, it sure is. That's one of the reasons why they get so much snow because it gets uplifted in that area and everything gets squeezed out. Yeah. Uh, not as extensive as, uh, there, there's alpine permafrost, but uh, there's not much land down in the southern hemisphere. And so consequently, the, 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 the volume is much, much less. A small percentage of what we see in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Isn't there a super volcano in that area somewhere There's lots of volcanoes there. Yeah, but a super volcano along the lines of Yellowstone, which is this giant. Oh, oh, you, know, you mean like a caldera yeah. situation. I don't know. I don't know. I ought to, but I don't. Sorry. Okay. Oh, sure. Given that the drop off off the coast is pretty steep, um, you know anything about methane hydrate formation? I don't. Not my not my area of knowledge. So I'm just happy I get to go where I get to go. So yeah, yeah, Clay. When those large floods occur um, and go through the, the, the farmland, where does it finally enter into the? That's on the east side of the fire. Yeah, no, it's, it's on, it's, it, let's see, no, that goes into the Pacific. Oh, it goes into the Pacific. Yeah, yeah, it goes, it goes down on the other side, yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, uh, just a, 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 an update on Manuel. Manuel ended up uh, becoming the best graduate student. He, he, he got his undergraduate degree at CU Denver and then entered into our, uh, into our master's program, and he got into geospatial analysis. Uh, he was giving a paper uh, a year and a half ago at uh, the a Association of American Geographers out in San Francisco, and somebody from the National Geographic mapping, they're all just the, I call them the spooks, they're part of NSA, um, <laughs> approached him and wanted to know if he'd be interested in meeting with them uh, at five o'clock. He said yes. And long story short, he's now working for them uh, in in that region and uh, back in D.C. So uh, he's moved back there. Best grad student I ever had. Just great. And became a U.S. citizen. And married the daughter of the vice president of uh, Dish Network. So, oh. <laughs> so they're trying to map this area more carefully? To, is that what he's working on? Like right. Well, we're, we're doing that with the drones. What we're trying to do with the drones now is we're flying, we're flying cross sections at known locations. So each time we go back there, we fly across. And we know that we have lost, um, since 2016, we have lost um, 11 meters of ice. 11 meters of ice. So almost two to three meters per year is how rapidly that is deflating very, very quickly. And so, and the terminus is coming back very rapidly as well. So it's a, it's a sick area. And I tell the students that are there, I said, take a good look around, take lots of pictures, because if you're lucky enough to get back here, it's not gonna look the same. It's changing that rapidly. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Did you guys name any mountains after yourselves? <laughs> no. No, we haven't done that. No, the Chilean government wouldn't, wouldn't would probably frown on that. But what we are trying to do, we are trying to educate the local the local uh, kids there and, and stuff. And so part of this uh, IRES proposal that we've got to the NSF is to develop modules to 
to get these people interested in what they've got. They should be doing the research there, not some clowns from from uh, from, from CU Denver. So you know, they we need to have we need to have Chileans interested in Chilean um, climatology, interested in Chilean uh, Chilean geology, Chilean everything, and so you know try to break that that uh, cycle where the, the only thing that's open to them is mines or 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 uh, mines or, or the military. Do they have names for the mountains? No, no. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them, just don't have names because there's still not a lot of people there. There's still not a lot of people there. You know, and we'll talk with uh, Jonathan, Chilean Jonathan, and he'll call something shark tooth, or he'll call something you know by some other name. You know, nobody else calls it that, just Jonathan, and nobody else knows what he's talking about except the people who work with Jonathan. And so, if that's how things get passed on, then maybe that's how it'll happen. I don't know, but uh, he, he's a he's a bit of a peak bagger, and uh, so he tries to find one. This this shark's tooth he's never been able to conquer yet, so it's still uh, still by itself hadn't been been topped. So yeah. So I missed the beginning. I apologize. Where, where was Manuel born? He was he was born in uh, Punta Arenas, Chile, down south, down south of Chile. Not on one of the sheep farms. No, 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 not here. He uh, he went to uh, he started he started school at uh, Universidad Chile Austral Southern Chile University, uh, and then hooked up with with Jonathan as a guide up there, and uh, then finished up his degree up here. Yes. With the school in Patagonia, is there a, a lot of research being done in? Um, the North Pole and the Antarctica, how fast that's melting. Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's lots and lots of research. The the thing that's neat about this is there hasn't been. This is probably the last climatologically in terms of if you're a glaciologist, this is the last great uh, uh, unknown location. So you got the fourth largest ice field on the planet, and there is little to nothing known about it. And that's what makes it attractive to me, and I just wish I had discovered it, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, at the more closer to the beginning of my career than the end of it. But that's why we have uh, grad students. What was the last name of the fellow from Evergreen again? Lydic, L-E-I-D-I-C-H. Yeah. I thought with his mom being a teacher, I, I might have heard the last name before, but I guess not. Uh, so okay. the ground is 120 kilometers? Yes. And uh, it's an no, it's just oh, one it's way. A, it's a, a It's not a loop. No, you start. You start. So you you start at the south, north. and you come out at the north. Yeah. So you go in at at at, uh, at Lago Plomo, and go across the Neff, adjacent to the Colonia. Come out at Sol de Mayo at the at Lago Colonia, and so and Rio Colonia. Sure no, that's the distance from Lago Plomo to Sol de Mayo is 120 kilometers. So you, you come out. You no, no. You have to. You drive out. So you, along, the, all of these old old gauchos lands and things, and and you know it's it's a it's a it's a dirt road. It's probably ten miles of dirt road that takes five hours to to traverse. Because December. Yeah. Carry some sort of radio that could summon help yes. you if you had to. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because when you're back there two weeks away from anything, the only way out, in fact, we well, don't want to hear my, my troubles, but on July, January 3rd, I'm going to tell you anyway, January 3rd of, of, uh, of, of 20, 2017, I put my backpack on and felt something pop. And carrying pretty heavy pack. I've, been, I've carried heavy packs all my life. That's, that's part of the problem. And at any rate, um, first mile was just horrible, but there wasn't any only way out is either helicopter, which would be expensive as hell, and or hiking. And so I first mile every day for the next week or so, it would just be agony, agony. I got home, thought it'd be thought it'd be fine, did all the ended up ended up I had blown out discs in my back and had one surgery and that lasted for four months and then had to have fusion for the lower lumbar. So so I, I I've given my back to uh, to the northern Patagonia ice field. 
But uh, mm -hmm. fortunately, the good news is I'm fine now. I'm back running again. Mm -hmm. Yep. So able to stand up here. When it, I, I was at a point where I couldn't stand for more than 30 seconds. I couldn't take a shower. I just couldn't. You know, that's how bad it was. So we have some really good docs at, uh, at Anschutz Medical Campus. <laughs> They're good. Yeah. During the summer, um, anywhere from 65 to 75. If you're lucky, you get a good 80 degree day. We had a good 80 degree day on Lago Cancun. You know, went swimming in there. Um, they're not that cold. You know, 30s, 30s during the day, 20s at night. They they don't get the coldness that we get here. They just don't, because you don't have the land mass to get those really cold. You know, continental Arctic air masses and continental polar air masses that we get here. They've been surrounded by ocean, so it's, everything's very, very much more moderated. It must be colder in the middle of the ice field itself. Than the yeah, planets. yeah, sure. It, it looks like uh, you weren't getting out in the middle of the right. field itself. Right, no, we weren't. Nope, we're looking at the outlet glaciers because that's where all the variance is occurring. That's where you want to. That's where you want to be. Has anyone ever tried to go in the middle to take yeah. the core samples? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and. And they're they're relatively stable. They're relatively stable. The interior is relatively stable. Uh, it's these. You have to realize though that the lower in elevation, the warmer the climate, and the less snow falls during the winter. And so, what's going to happen is as that as that temperatures rise, it's going to be the lower stuff, the low hanging fruit that gets picked and that gets melted. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. Nope. Don't know. Good question, though. You guys are got lots of good questions. Yeah. Are you guys using uh, structure for motion photogrammetry for the elevation model with the drones? Uh, yes. That's exactly what they're doing. Uh huh. Well, yep. Can't we take the topological maps of satellite? Um, like, there's a satellite I know that measures sea level. Yeah. And uh, you'd think they could use data from that satellite to really create a topological map of the glacier that would change over time. Yeah. We get better resolution when you're closer. Well, that's true. <laughs> so we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to figure out exactly, you know, what different areas of the glacier are changing, if some areas changing more rapidly than others. And so whereas you get an overall view with the satellite stuff, I agree with you on that, to determine what in our cross section is changing more rapidly and what the effects are of, of the, the side walls and things like that that are really, eating and melting. pretty well what the volume loss is, although a lot yep. of it might be hollows under the glacier that you wouldn't detect until the... Until it collapses, collapse. right. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay. Sure. Uh, I mean, like, we'll do too. We'll give you, like, half a meter resolution. Do you really need better than that for the elevation model? I do. Okay. Yeah, I was just really <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know, I can, you know, we can get we can get centimeter resolution. No, I know you can get it with yeah. the drones, but I was just. I'm. Uh, well, one of the other things I do is microclimatology, and so I like to look at what's the input of long wave radiation from the valley sidewalls, and what effect is that having, you know, because what what's happening is we're getting a bowing of the glacier, whereas the areas next to the sidewalls are melting faster because of the long wave radiation from there. So I'm also looking at that too. So I can't get that kind of, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank this you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All of you to come tomorrow. Uh, for <sighs>